And um, I normally, I live in LA, so I bartend there more so than anything. And in New York, I like to bartend as well, uh, just because it is very different. It's spirit forward. And um, whereas LA, it's more fruit forward. So, yeah. Um, thanks for coming in. And... Um, we'll just get started. So, um, I, this class is going to be talking about tools and how to use them, just techniques. So, um, uh, excuse me, sorry. There's like a, a lot of people around right now, um, but they're going to be going soon. Um, so techniques and how to use them tools. All right. So. Um, I'm sure you have all gotten some tools as well uh, from just the program itself. Um, so in your in your packet or in your package, you should be either receiving or you should have already received a shaker tins as well as um, a jigger, as well as a muddler, a, a spoon to stir with as well. So let's go over the spoon first so bar spoon it's normally um a very long let me go ahead and place you right here real quick it's normally like a long twisted spoon okay there are different kinds uh, some are twisted and they have a very small twist so you'll be able to see them like that whereas others are going to be twisted very finely and it's going to be very tight twist um, whenever you're looking for a bar spoon, you want to look for ones that have a tight twist because those are going to be the ones that give you allowance when you want to stir properly. Okay. Stirring, it's uh, it's one of the hardest things to learn in bartending. In your small shaker tin or in your mixing glass from within, you want the back of the spoon to be touching the inner walls of that shaker tin or mixing glass. And you wanna keep going constantly. Um, so you want that spoon to, the back of the spoon to constantly be touching and you never want it to not touch. You wanna treat all of the ice that you have inside as if it were just one cube. So as you're, tw or, sorry, as you're stirring it, you shouldn't have any kind of sound that goes with it. It should just be like, instead of hearing the as you're spinning. Uh, this is to prevent uh, over dilution. And um, it's also to aid in making sure that you can get to the proper uh, chilled or the proper uh, temperature of cold before it dilutes too quickly. So that's why we want to learn how to stir correctly. The way that you hold a bar spoon is going to be, I normally think of Spider-Man when I'm doing this. So Spider-Man, uh, he does this in order to sling out his web, right? So with these two fingers, you're going to place your bar spoon right in between these two creases of your fingers. Okay, the pinky can do whatever it wants, and then you're going to make an okay sign with your thumb and your finger. Okay, as you do that, the bar spoon will be up here, your fingers, it's going to go in between, and these will stay stationary. These, the okay sign is only to keep it sturdy or to keep it from going all over the place. These two fingers, these guys are to I guess be the gas so they're going to be moving the spoon around the best way to practice is by treating your shaker tin like a clock so as you look into the shaker tin you look inside you got 12 o'clock 6 o'clock so you do 1 so 12 to 6 6 to 12 so you could do 12 to 6 6 to 12 6 12 to 6 six to 12, you know, go back and forth in a C formation. Or if you feel like you're ready, go for the full 360 all around. 
and constantly keep going. Um, it'll take some time to get used to, but once you can do it, you can never unlearn it. It's just something that'll stick with you for the rest of your life. Um, so practice doing that. That's probably going to be the most important skill to know. Um, that's going to be taking more time uh, than most of the other skills. All right. Do we have any questions about bar spoons so far? If you do, don't hesitate to just uh, ask the questions in the chat. Okay. Um, all right. So next, what I'll talk about is, well, I'm still on, on spoons, actually. So there is several types of backs to the spoons. So in your long spoon, there's a regular spoon, which is going to be about an eighth of an ounce. Okay. That's what a bar spoon is a standard uh, measurement of it's an eighth of an ounce. Um, so at the very back, they typically have some sort of tip of sorts. Um, it could be of like a muddler. So that one I wouldn't really use too much because I don't want to just muddle something with my bar spoon and then have it bend on me. But, um, it's also just a nice, just in case utility to have the muddler back portion is going to look like a disc so it'll look like here's the bar spoon and then here's the disc that's on there and then over here is the spoon portion so right here this part is a disc it's a circle and that's the one that you use to kind of press on whatever you want to muddle um, it's also good as like a counterweight, which is what a teardrop is supposed to be. A teardrop, that one is pretty self-explanatory. It's just like, it looks like a teardrop at the very, very end. Um, it's got weight to it. It's very nice to stir with just because, again, that counterweight is going to help you have like, it's going to be easier for you to keep moving and not stop. Um, another good one is um, a Hoffman, a Hoffman bar spoon. So Hoffman bar spoon, uh, you can find that at Cocktail Kingdom. It's got like, it's like a flat paddle. It looks like a flat paddle with a bit of an edge or sorry, like a bit of a fold. So it's in an angle at the very end, but it's mostly a flat, uh, flat uh, paddle like thing. Okay, so when you use that you can use it for uh, matcha you can get a pretty good uh dosage with that just like a little a little um scoop then toss into your cocktail if you need to you can also use that if let's say you're with big tongs you're going to grab a massive ice cube nice clear big cube you're going to drop it into an old-fashioned glass, but you already poured your old-fashioned into it. You want to grab with your claws, put it over, and if it doesn't fit, this Hoff Hoffman bar spoon is really good to kind of aid the cube as into the old-fashioned glass so that there's no big splash. So it'll just kind of uh, lower it in for you. And that, that way... Um, that way it just works out, um, without splashing anything. The next one, it's going to be like a trident. So it'll have three prongs, one, two, and then one in the middle. So it's going to be a, it's supposed to be like a, a, to help aid in getting garnishes. So stabbing olives or stabbing uh, cherries on the fly. Um, I personally don't like to use it because I don't like to have holes in my garnishes. I like to just use my uh, bar spoon, pull it out, and stab it with a garnish spear, and then leave the top of the glass for the person to choose whether or not they want to eat it, they want to drop it in the till, whatever, whatever it is. So there's that bar spoon as well. I'm trying to think if there are any others. We went over Teardrop, Hoffman, the Muddler, the Spear. I think that's pretty much most of the things that you'll see. 
there are going to be other uh, backings to many bar spoons, like a pineapple or a skull. Um, all of these is just like a more of a of a look thing. So you can you can choose to have something like that. It also can be used as like a counterweight. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what bar spoons is, is all about. There are different lengths as well. I mean, there are short lengths like this. There are longer lengths. Um, there are debates out there on uh, you know whether or not uh, the length is going to help aid in some sort of way. Um, I personally like using like 36 to 46 inch. So it's pretty long. Um, they just feel better. And I, I do kind of, it'll help make it faster. Or at least it, it does help me feel like it's faster. So um, be on the lookout for that as well. Just um, and, uh, a really good, um, smart thing to do is to just go to a store and uh, check it out. You know, if you live in New York, Octel Kingdom definitely has uh, they have a store there. So you can go check out a bunch of the tools and actually use them and see how you feel with them. So that's an option there. Not, not sure about anywhere else at the moment, but there should be places. I'll just look, look them up. OK, so that's that is pretty much bar spoons. Any questions about bar spoons? OK. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and go further in with let's do our 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 workhorse, the shaker tins. OK, you're going to find cobbler shakers. Cobbler shakers are like um, a three piece shaker set. There's the, the main shaker, then there's the cap, and then there's, or sorry, the strainer cap, and then there's the cap that goes on top of the strainer cap. In order for you to start shaking, you take off the strainer cap, and then you keep the sh that strainer cap on top so you could strain your cocktail and have not a lot of ice. So cobbler shaker, it's very good. It's got a different technique. In a lot of cases, you kind of see um this happened with them a lot it's like a twist and then snap so it's like shake shake snap shake shake snap shake shake snap and that's like a very good technique to use when you're using that kind of shaker uh tin the cobbler um in other cases i've seen people do like um this weird sensation where they have let's just pretend i'm holding the shaker tin here's the main the other and then the other piece just like that i'm holding it now and then i shake it like this right typically i want to shake it like this uh in this case i'm doing like a seesaw like this so i've seen a lot of that happening when you're shaking um specifically if you go to some place like double chicken please also located in new york um that's what you'll probably see a lot um, it's a very good way to truly aerate your drink and also make sure that the ice cubes don't completely shatter too fast because that's the point of shaking a cocktail is to aerate, dilute a lot of water, and to make it super cold. But if you can keep away from diluting the ice too fast, then you can guarantee yourself an extremely cold cocktail which is what we're looking for. So just keep going, do that, and you should be pretty much happy with the result. So cobbler shakers are great if you're going to be doing more of a home bartending thing. But if you're going to want to get used to more of a bar environment uh, with high volume and just, um, just restaurant bar, whatever it is, the best shaker tins, and you will always find them there, is going to be those uh, Boston Shaker uh, tin shaker sets. Just two-piece, small shaker tin, large shaker tin. They're the best. They're super quick um, and easy to use. You can use them in multiple ways, and it just it works out. So most of the time, what's going to happen is with the small shaker, you're going to be adding all of your ingredients to that small shaker. The small shaker tin 
Um, and also another thing to note uh, is to always start with the cheapest ingredient and end with the most expensive ingredient. The best way to know what that is, is to read the recipe and they'll always start with, with like uh, bourbon, uh, Angostura aromatic bitters, uh, simple syrup. So you know that the, the bourbon is going to be the most expensive. And then the, the Angostura second expensive and then the sugar is going to be the least expensive. So every time you read a recipe, essentially just read from the bottom up and that's going to be uh, your order of operations most of the, the most of the time, unless it needs something specific like um, egg whites typically go in last so that it doesn't cook with acidity. I have a question here. What's the ideal amount of time to use a shaker? OK, so let's get to that point, too. Um, when you're shaking your shaker tin, uh, typically um, it's going to be a lot faster than when you're stirring. Stirring is going to be about 24 uh, seconds or so, whereas shaking it should be about 12 seconds. That's like kind of like the sweet spot in a lot of cases. Um, you do, however, want to keep in mind that there are other ways to shake, too, and you want to keep it around the same time. So 12 seconds, you want to seal the top, the, the, the large tin on the very top, you want to tap it in order to create this vacuum effect that's going to take place when you shake. You want to have one side completely flush. So that means the shaker tin and shaker tin are going to be completely locked like this. On the other side, it's going to look like it's open like that. It's going to look like it's open. Uh, but the shaker tins inside of it. So once you have that, you want to make sure that open portion is facing you. So in case that there's any liquid, uh, that liquid is going to be um, splashing onto you or behind you. Okay. Another thing to note when you're shaking, when you shake, you want to shake back and forth. Okay. Back and forth as to making sure that the ice within is going to be hitting both bottoms of each tin. So you want to hear the kung, 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 okay? So each each side is getting hit with the ice inside, okay? That's the casual way to do it. There's another method that Dave Arnold had, like, uh, written about in his book, Liquid Intelligence, uh, which is, like, a different technique where you kind of try to create a spiral within the shaker with the ice. So making it spiral as you're shaking it, uh, apparently what it does, it helps rounds out those edges of each of those ice cubes and then uh, thus allowing it to be sturdy enough to not dilute or shatter that quickly. Um, which again, it's gonna, it's gonna get, that, those shaker tins to a point where it's called uh, too cold to hold, um, which is a prime thing that uh, a lot of us bartenders are striving for when it comes to a lot of our cocktails. We want it to be super, super cold, um, especially because we know if they're not in front of us at the bar, it's going to take some time for those cocktails to get to them at their table or wherever they're at. So you want to kind of create a DNA swirl with those ice cubes and shake it back and forth. And that's how, um, if you try it and if you do it correctly, you'll start to see like ice forming outside of the shaker tins. I've done it so many times before. It's super cool to see. Um, people have done it uh, by mistake or on purpose, whatever it is, but that is like the most ideal thing to see. Uh, it's, the most ideal thing that we'd want um, doesn't um, dilute over dilute our cocktail. Okay, so again, uh, keeping it at that ish. Okay, the twelve second give or take. All right, uh, good. Now let's talk about some strainers. There's going to be a bunch of different kinds of strainers. Um, the one that's going to be the most familiar is going to be our Hawthorne strainer. Uh, 
not to be confused with Hoffman spoon, our Hawthorne strainer is going to either have no prongs, two prongs, or four prongs, okay? Um, but it's always going to be like a circular thing with the handle on the bottom. And it's going to have a spring uh, on the bottom of the Hawthorne strainer. That spring is to basically fit snug in the small or the large shaker tin. Um, and there's always going to be like an L lip on top of where the strainer is so that you can, with your finger, push it down and lock it in place, allowing for all of the ingredients flow through those springs and through those uh, gates or that have been given allowance from the, the strainer itself. And that's gonna pour out the ingredients without pouring out a lot of the ice cube. Um, if you have a, a strainer with widely spaced spring, the wide space spring is mainly used for high volume. So it's for places where they don't care about um, ice chips going into the cocktail. They just want the cocktail to be poured quickly. So that's where you would use that uh, type of strainer, uh, type of Hawthorne strainer. There are other Hawthorne strainers that are more uh, built or manufactured for craft. So craft cocktails are going to want to take more time and they try to make sure that it's uh, cleaner, uh, less debris or less um, ice chips, I guess you could say. So they want a clean looking drink. Um, so whenever you use those, the springs are going to be a lot tighter, um, a lot tighter versus those that are widely gapped. All right, so once you start pouring with those, it's gonna take a lot longer for them to pour. But, um, so it'll take some time to pour, uh, but you're getting a finer strain pour, okay? There are other methods that you can use to, to make it fast. You could use the same thing, the widely spread spring with a fine mesh sprain, uh, strainer. So a fine mesh strainer, it'll look like a miniature cone, look like a cone but it'll be like a, a lot of locked lacy looking uh, a metal and that's supposed to finally strain things so, so that like not little bits of herbs get into the cocktail it's just going to be pretty much mostly clear no pulp nothing like that so if you pour with one of those on top of one of those strainers it'll still pour rather quickly and, and you'll get rid of all those ice chips that you don't want to use. So you can use a combination of all of these things, just depending on uh, what fits best with your style of uh, cocktail or bartending, excuse me. Okay, so that's Hawthorne strainer. Uh, typically in the gates of a Hawthorne strainer, it's going to be two lines like this. And there's going to be a steel cap right in the center. So if I'm going to pour a cocktail, you'll, you're going to see two uh, streams typically coming down from the strainer. Um, that is like another random little trick that you can use. Uh, let's say that if you, let's say you made two cocktails in one, uh, in one go, in one shaker tin. So let's say it's two margaritas or something. You shake it up, you do everything you need to do, and now you're at the point where you need to pour. You could put your two rocks glasses together and then pour both of those cocktails at the exact same time, making sure that that steel plate lines up with the rims of the glasses, okay? So as you pour down, you can pour and make sure that they're pouring down evenly so that you get an even pour of both of those cocktails um, all at the same time, saving you time as well. So that's a neat little trick. Um, not a lot of bartenders know, so it's good to know that. Any questions? Let me know. All right, so that's the strainer. Uh, I already told you about the fine mesh strainer. There is another strainer 
it's called a julep strainer. Okay. I'll go ahead and write that down real quick. Julep strainer. Okay. So uh, in the chat, I have it down, uh, julep strainer. So the julep strainer, it is. it looks like a big spoon, like a big spoon like this big. And it has like pretty solid big holes in him, kind of like a coriander or a bit like that. So with that one, that's supposed to fit into your mixing glass. And then you're supposed to, with the handle of the spoon, push back on that handle. And then that cup of, the, of that strainer is going to lock in place with the mixing glass or the small shaker tin. Um, that way... When you're pouring with the julep strainer, it's not going to, uh, it's the purpose for the julep strainer is for stirred cocktails. So, uh, going back, shaken cocktails are for aerating. We always shake cocktails that have citrus, dairy, or, um, egg white. Okay. So those, those different things are going to need or they require shaking because acidity will brighten the egg, the egg white will foam really well. The dairy creams up and gives it like another foamy aspect as well and a creaminess. So we want to shake those things in order to aerate them. When we stir cocktails, we're trying to refrain from doing any of that. We do not want any aeration we do not want over dilution. Stirred cocktails typically are very delicate. So we want to make sure that it's as perfect as possible while maintaining the structure of that cocktail. Okay. Stirred cocktails, the structure that you're looking for is so that it is uh, viscous. So it's like it's thicker. It's going to be like, uh, like blood. Oh, that's like a terrible example. So it's syrupy. Um, just think syrup. Um, it's not going to be as thick and viscous like syrup. It's not going to be honey. But if you put, let's say, two of the, you have two vodkas. You put one of those vodkas into the freezer. One vodka stays out. Next day, you pour with your regular room temperature vodka. Then you pour with your freezer vodka you will notice that the freezer vodka will be more together and it'll have like a gloopiness to it. That's the body that we're trying to create when we're stirring our cocktails because the colder it gets, the more, uh, the stiffer it gets, I guess. Um, and so the julep strainer is pretty much for that. So the julep strainer uh, helps to not agitate while it's being strained into a glass. So it maintains that body that we're looking for. Okay. Any questions on that? Let me know. Okay. So we just went over the bar spoon, the technique on how to do a bar spoon. We went over shaker tin and how to, how to shake properly um, and what to shake as well. And we went over some of the strainers and the different uses and the different ways we can use those. Um, okay, so that's, we're already um, almost done with most of the main tools that you're gonna be using at a bar. For now, um, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, so just go to the restroom, do what you need to do. Um, we'll get back here at around at uh, 3 uh, 45 and we'll continue with our lesson. We're going to go over jiggers and other things of that sort. Okay. All right. So I will see you guys in 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Stay awesome.
I am back. Can everyone hear me? Okay. All right, so let's get started with our second portion of this lesson, which is going to be, um, we'll start off with the jiggers. Jiggers is one of those important tools that we need in bartending in order to basically help aid with consistency in our cocktails. Um, a lot of people in different places will argue that, you know, they have the best pour. Um, they can just free pour all the time. It's fine. Um, the reality is that you can never beat the consistency of using jiggers for everything. So my, uh, I'm going to say that using jiggers is going to be the only way that you're going to really get solid consistency. Um, free pouring, even though you can practice for as long as you do, it's, it's never going to guarantee uh, that you get the exact same thing every time. And it's not because of skill. It's just because, That's just what happens with pouring. You never know if uh, something happens. There could be like a random bubble that just approaches and then just ruins your count. So um, I love Jiggers um, so much. All right. Uh, Jiggers is going to look like a, it's like two different cups on each side. Typically, um, there are Japanese Jiggers, which are a lot thinner, um, considered to be the sniper of Jiggers. And there are thicker ones, which are shorter, um, that are like American dunkers, uh, is what we like to call them. So with those, uh, easier for fast-paced locations, um, you just dunk. They will splash sometimes um, if you're not careful. And then you have Japanese jiggers, which are long, and they're like very easy to be accurate with, but they're, they're poor, they'll pour for a lot longer. than uh, an American dunker. So um, I like using Japanese jiggers because that's what I like to use. Um, American dump dunkers can be fun depending on where I'm working. So uh, what you'll notice on a lot of these is that one side is typically going to be about two ounces or 60 milliliters, um, which you want to stick with if you're in the U.S., Uh, you want to stick with uh, ounces because that's what you're going to see most of the time here. Um, if you're going to like Europe and if you're going to be living there, then you want to uh, get familiar with uh, milliliters because that's what they're going to be using there, which tends to be just a little bit higher than uh, what we use here. The, the jigger is... Is going to have little lines from within the cup so make sure to read what that uh, measurement is going to be in a lot of mine it's uh the big cup is going to have one and a half ounces line and then the two ounce is going to be the very top uh the other side will be uh if i fill it up all the way it's going to uh, turn out to be one ounce there's going to be a line that signifies uh three quarters of an ounce and another line that says half an ounce Typically, you won't see a quarter of an ounce, but if you buy one of the smaller uh, jiggers, then you're going to see, like, uh, fill this side for three quarters of an ounce. Then the other side will be fill this one for half an ounce, and then there's a line in that one that says quarter of an ounce, if you want to get super fancy with things. So just make sure to be incredibly accurate when you do, do, uh, when you do your pours. Um, something to kind of get familiar with or to gain the dexterity for is to be able to pour and then pour into your small shaker tin that way. So you can pour from the back or just pour in front, but always make sure to keep it right next to your shaker tin. So you pour into your jigger, pour into your shaker and bam, same thing, constant, super easy. Um, yeah, so jigger is super important. You'll also see that some places will have, um, measuring spoons, like a teaspoon or measuring cups and stuff. Sometimes you'll use those for depending if you're going to be working at a craft bar or not. So, um, 
there's also that option. Um, so overall, that's what jiggers are capable of doing. They're going to help uh, your consistency in every cocktail so that people come to you for a signature cocktail that they like from you. Um, that's a very good way to kind of bring people back uh, to the bar. Okay. So uh, gone over bar spoon, shaker tin, um, jigger, and our Hawthorne strainer or just strainers in general. Um, those are the very important ones to go through. Um, in my opinion, if you're going to be working at a bar, um, one thing that I do want to mention is that we should all learn about a my tie since I am in Hawaii. I kind of want to stay within the theme of Hawaii in a sense. Um, so I'm going to pull something out real quick because I want everyone to know that a Mai Tai is not a Mai Tai when it has orange juice or pineapple juice, okay? Um, a Mai Tai is a Mai Tai when it's made with, you know, two or three different rums. Typically, it's two different rums, one agricole and one uh, dark rum or 51. Um, so let me go ahead and pull out this recipe that I really liked and share that with you. Anything else is like a riff off of the Mai Tai, I guess, but it's not a Mai Tai if it's got the, the juices. Okay, so let's do Anders Ericsson's version of a Mai Tai. So um, it's going to be, the recipe is as follows, uh, Mai Tai. One ounce of Jamaican rum, one ounce of rum agricole. Rum agricole is going to be like a French rum. It's made from sugarcane juice rather than the entire sugarcane itself. Okay. Half an ounce of dark rum, half an ounce of orange curacao. Okay. You want to make sure that it's a very dry orange liqueur. So in my opinion, my favorite is going to be the Pierre Ferrand dry curacao. Uh, that orange uh, liqueur is going to be really good on a Mai Tai. So definitely take that um, to heart. Okay. Uh, one ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice. And then the last ingredient is going to be half an ounce of orja syrup, spelled O R. G E A T. That's orja syrup. And orja is basically an almond and some spices uh, syrup, mostly almond. And that's everything that goes into this cocktail. Okay. It's not going to take any kind of juice, no pineapple juice, no orange juice. So just remember that if you see that at the bar, uh, you'll know right away that that bar doesn't really know uh, how to do a proper Mai Tai slash probably any other drink. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, this is a shake, shake and strain cocktail. You garnish this uh, with many things. So garnishing and tiki is always super fun and exciting. Um, and this one, you're going to be doing like a mint bouquet, a massive mint bouquet, a lime husk that's inverted with a cherry inside filled with 151 rum which is a very high proof definitely flammable which is the next part you want to set that on fire and then you want to uh, uh pass it over to your guest who's going to be drinking this mai tai uh, it goes into a double fashion glass or two rocks glass um, and it comes with crushed ice okay that's your mai tai um, that's how it should be done Again, you see orange juice or pineapple juice, it does not belong in that cocktail. We're trying to get away from the 70s, 80s, when they didn't care about cocktails very much. Okay. Awesome. Any questions about that? Okay, doesn't look like it. All right, last thing we'll go over is the bottle opener. 
Okay, we've all seen bottle openers before, but there is the one that looks kind of like a paddle, sort of, and it comes with a little circle or a keyhole, and then the other side will have the bottle opening portion where you crack open the beers. Uh, that's also a very important tool that I feel like I should go over. Um, in a lot of cases, there are issues with pulling out the pour spouts from our bottles. Uh, so the way that we handle that is by using the church key bottle opener. Okay, so look for a church key bottle opener. It'll look like a keyhole, sort of. Um, it'll be a circle and then an oval-like thing around it, so as to look like a keyhole. Uh, the way it works is that you put the circle over the pour spout um, onto the rubber in between the like the neck of the bottle and that rubber portion of the pour spout, and then you shimmy it in, and then you pull it up like that, and then that way it won't be stuck. That way it's easier to um, pull out. And you don't have to worry um, about uh, taking so much time to try to take or pull a apart this uh, pour spout um, or just throwing it away. I've seen that happen too. It's like the worst thing. So make sure to do those things um, and you should be okay. Awesome. Is there any, any questions at all uh, before I continue here i will want to mention that um uh yes so i will mention that in order to uh finish your curriculum here with uh lbs um just make sure to watch at least three of these videos three of these weekly wednesday videos and then uh, submit a video yourself of 30 seconds or more to the link. Let me go ahead and try to, it's a little bit different over the phone. I have the link right here. So, on this link, just send a 30 second uh, video explaining what you've learned or uh, just anything uh, like that, generally like your favorite cocktail and how to make it. Um, so anything you've learned, something like that, uh, just send it to this link right here. Uh, again, 30 seconds or more. And then uh, that should help with uh, your curriculum and your requirements for completing the certification. Okay. And with that, I think um, that should do it. Um, if you have any questions, again, just go ahead and ask. Um, I'll be here. And thanks again for coming by and learning about tools and techniques.